Good afternoon. It is a particular privilege to welcome you here this afternoon for uh, a talk that I think is all near and dear to our hearts, which is about the future of the humanities uh, in the uh, contemporary academy. Our speaker today, if raise your hand if you got that odd little missive, the salvo that I sent out yesterday to the camp. I don't do that very often because uh, there, there are a couple of things that I believe deeply. Um, and uh, one of them is that, uh, well, one of them, T Thomas Sowell once said, people who enjoy meetings shouldn't be in charge of anything. <laughs> That's one. Uh, a second one is that um, the proliferation of email is uh, a device of our ancient adversary, the devil. <laughs> and uh, I hate it, usually. But every now and again, it has a good uh, purpose. By the way, there are a couple of seats right up here in the front. Uh, I know the, 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 the Baptists and the Presbyterians have gravitated toward the back, but uh, there are a few up here in the front for the Episcopalians. <laughs> Our speaker for today is, uh, is someone uh, who I am very proud publicly and formally in this setting to introduce to the King's College community. And uh, if you will bear with me, I really do want to talk about why he's a significant figure in the history of the King's College. Dr. Herb London, I'll give his biography, more about his biography in just a moment. but. Um, Herb London is a hero of mine. Uh, I've heard him speak many times. I think I've read just about everything that he's ever written. I was introduced to him several years ago uh, through uh, one of my mentors, Emmanuel Camporis, the former CEO of the American Standard Corporation, who's also a, uh, an FOH, friend of Herb. <coughs> uh, but I got to meet Herb London uh, in Vienna, Austria, at uh, uh, a wonderful gathering put together by the Hudson Institute where uh, he served for many years as president and still is president emeritus of the Hudson Institute. It was like meeting Bono for me to meet uh, Herb London and uh, he did not disappoint. Many of you will not know that Herb London is also a rock star, a genuine rock star. He did have a top 10 hit, uh, Once Upon a Time. And he has other things about his biography that are, are interesting, sexy. Uh, his, his daughter is Stacy London. For those of you that uh, know what not to wear, um, here we go. So this is how you get the kids interested. <laughs> Herb. This is how you get him on board. Uh, Herb London is also someone who is, I can say without perjuring myself, is someone who is, is involved on a daily and weekly basis in helping shape uh, global policy. That is a true statement. I don't know anyone who is uh, more regularly on the phone with world leaders, senators, and congressmen than Herb. And I'm very uh, proud, uh, you've seen the press release go out, but I was able to prevail upon Herb London to move his premier think tank, the London Center for Policy Research, onto the campus of the King's College. and. Uh, he is now just across the hall from the fabulous other Dr. Thornbury, Dr. Kimberly Carmichael Thornbury, so that is where his office is. There may be opportunities for some of you to help shape the world through the London Center for Policy Research, but it is, it's a privilege to have Herb London here today. Uh, Herb London is the President Emeritus of the Hudson Institute, 
He served as the Institute's president from 1997 of December to March 2011. He is Professor Emeritus and former John M. Olin Professor of Humanities at New York University. He was responsible for creating the Gallatin School of Individualized Study in 1972 and was its dean until 1992. The school was organized to promote the study of great books and classic texts, hence the reason we are here today. He's a graduate of Columbia, 1960, and the recipient of the PhD from NYU in 1966. In 1989, Dr. London was one of the Republican candidates for mayor of New York City. He did not win. <laughs> Uh, he, in 1990, he was the Conservative Party candidate for governor of New York, garnering more votes than any third party candidate in the state's history. In 1994, he was the Republican Party candidate for New York State Comptroller, losing in a close election, and that is a fascinating story. Ask him about it sometime. He is very distinguished. It's a, it's a huge privilege to have him here to talk about the death of the humanities, a lamentation. But... Uh, as a point of personal privilege, uh, I am going to go ahead in advance and ask the first question for the Q&A. Herb London is someone who is very close to Prime Minister Netanyahu. And so uh, the first question, I know we're talking about the humanities and we want questions on that, but if Herb, you could in the uh, Q&A uh, give your thoughts on the Prime Minister's stem winder yesterday before Congress, we would like to hear it. So before we invite Herb to come up and deliver his address, will you join me in prayer and ask God's blessing upon our assembly today? Our Father and our God, we give you thanks for this day, for the multitude of ways in which you have made yourself known to us and given us opportunities for the cause of God and truth in our time. We thank you for Herb London, for being a sentinel in our culture, for being a leader on the world stage, for his investment in this city, his investment in higher education, his investment in, the, in matters of faith. We thank you for his witness and his legacy and ask that you would uh, uh, Help him to invest in this community now, the King's College, and we are uh, so honored to have him with us today. Give us attentive ears to hear what he has to say, and we ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Herb London. What an introduction. I only wish my mother were here to hear it. Uh, it, it was extraordinary. You know, I've, uh, I've given many speeches, and very often I find myself in an odd position where I now live in the shadow of my daughter. I noticed that some of the women in this room immediately recognize the name of Stacey London, who we've had that show, What Not to Wear, and has a new program called Love, Lust, or Run, which I assume you, some of you have seen. If not, she's also the host of The View, which occurs in the afternoon when you're presumably in classes. <laughs> but that introduction was very special. Uh, I feel as though I am privileged to be in the company of King's College, members of King's College, as well as the Thornberries, who I've known for some time, remarkable people, and I might add my dear friend Joe Lacante, who is, I guess, one of the most dynamic professors, not only in King's College, but perhaps in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me say uh, a few words in the way of introduction, because there's uh, several parts attached to this. I normally do not give papers. I don't like to do that. I like to speak extemporaneously. But I will, I will avoid doing that today because I have prepared a formal paper. But let me start by saying the following. Many years ago, I was engaged in research in Australia. And I came across an interesting document written by the Governor General in 1900. He was asked the question by many women in the UK about their chance of finding a mate in the land down under. under. These were women who were unmarried. They did not have a mate in their lives and they were looking for a place where there were a lot of males. Well, since Australia was organized as a penal colony, there were a lot of males. Well, the Governor General received so many of these requests, he wrote one reply. He said, the chances of finding 
a male here, are very good. He said the, the odds of finding your mate in the future are very good. The problem is the goods are very odd. <laughs> and the reason why I mention that is because based on what I'm about to tell you, which is a kind of traditional analysis, it will seem very odd. To many people, this view of the humanities, this view of understanding the nature of what has happened in the academy is very odd to many. Let me start by referring to an article that was written in 2013 in the journal First Things that I very, very often enjoy by Professor Patrick Deneen. He's a wonderful scholar, by the way, although we have our differences. He contends that the decline of the study of great books, we'll start talking about great books before I get to the humanities in general, the study of great books of Western civilization is to be found in the very arguments within the great books themselves, the decline of great books. While these arguments do exist, their role and extent of their influence is difficult to assess, but let me give you some of the serious arguments about the great books. Admittedly, the reflexive use of critical thinking which is one of the arguments that is very often used in conjunction with the great books, is an argument for the study of great books is absurd, since no one quite knows what critical thinking is or how to achieve it. Moreover, the essence of any thinking is related to knowledge, a knowledge core and an experience base. Without these conditions, critical thinking is merely one more cliche in the armory of academic rhetoric. I remember when I was in the Dean's group at New York University, there was a... Sorry. Oh. Okay. Sorry. I was in the Dean's group at New York University. The Dean's finally came to the conclusion after looking at all of the distribution requirements, when you probably know something about that, you have what is ostensibly a Chinese menu at most universities in the United States where you have humanities and social science and science, and you choose courses from one of those categories. The catalog is generally two, three hundred pages. And so you can select some very odd courses indeed. But the deans became very much concerned that there was no core, there was not one common experience that students had. And so they decided to create a course called Critical Thinking. And one day I went up to one of the classrooms in the main building at New York University, and I listened to the professor deal with this subject. And he puts on the board the following statement. What happens, what, that's the following question, what happens when we run out of fossil fuels? Well, there were some very odd responses. One young lady said, well, maybe we'll go to the moon and got fossil fuels. <laughs> Scratch my head. Where do you get the fuel to get to the moon? <laughs> Someone else said, well, you know, maybe we can dig very deep into the ground. And there were odd responses of that kind, and then it occurred to me, how can anyone make sensible responses? That is, you don't, do not understand the laws of supply and demand, and you do not understand the relationship between pricing and supply, it becomes very difficult to make an economic argument. And if you nothing, know nothing at all about the essential laws of physics, it's very difficult to talk about the preservation of energy, since if I move my hand, I can create energy, waves create energy, there are lots of ways of creating energy. So even if you ran out of fossil fuels, which I think is unlikely, there are ways of dealing with it. But if you know nothing about physics, and you know nothing about economics, and you do not have any history, and there's no background, it's very difficult to make a sensible observation. So what critical thinking became is the exchange of ignorant opinion. A very, very odd occasion indeed. Now, the second point that is raised about the so-called great books John Dewey argued that reading of great books is essential as a preparation for citizenship. But the problem with that is that Dewey understood citizenship as an individual circumscribed by a collective. The readings, he argued, are designed to justify an end, not an open-ended dialogue. Moreover, what Dewey really wanted to encourage was a certain kind of orientation very different from what the Founding Fathers had in mind when this nation was created. And it was based more on categorical rather than individual rights. Then there is the view that great books lead inexorably to some sort of humanitarian stance, a hallmark of civilizational insight. 
Yet it's interesting to note that Joseph Mengele, the butcher of Nazi depravity, was a scholar of classic texts. He taught classic texts at Heidelberg University. It's important to note that books can make a world and can destroy a world or even be irrelevant to the world. Great books have housed within them a treasure of human wisdom, but it is not yet revealed by simple reading. Thank you, sir. You see, your president is extremely versatile. <laughs> Are there books designed to perpetuate virtue or transform education? The answer is yes and no. This bifurcated model offered by Professor Deneen is a useful concept. For if one accepts the latter stance of transformation, great books may be an encumbrance best displaced at the heart of education. Deneen concludes by suggesting we consider humble books, not great books, or at least great books that teach humility, in contrast to those great books that advance a version of Promethean greatness, an aspiration that has undermined the study of books. What is called for is ultimately a liberation from the tyranny of our unconscious submission to the ideas that dominate our age by considering others that have been discarded. Clearly, this is praise, albeit modest praise, for humble books as a witness for where we stand at the moment. But I remain somewhat unpersuaded by his argument, in part because Deneen does not truly address the importance of great books in the total educational experience. He is right to contend these texts do not necessarily mold citizens or encourage critical thinking or offer civilizational insights. These are weak confirmations for great books as an educational core. What is important, what stands as the justification for great books, is that the canon asks the appropriate questions. Questions that, as Cardinal Newman noted, go to the very essence of education. Instead of being narrowly defined by disciplinary restrictions, great books cut across the human experience to ask, why are we here? How do we leave our mark? How do we control our inner desire? To whom do we owe allegiance and why? And recognizing the derision of death, death we all face, what gives life meaning? These are, of course, not the only questions, but they are queries unfastened to disciplinary study. Moreover, these questions designed to inspire thought, not simple answers, since they are not readily available. In a university setting where vocationalism is in the ascendancy, a place where students often regurgitate the anticipated response to professional testing, questions that provoke are rarely on display. Yet it is the questions that lie at the heart of the curriculum, and it is the questions that are evoked from the reading of great books. Professor Deneen appropriately tells us to moderate our claims about these texts. I would agree. Yet I would urge him to consider the real reasons these books should remain at the very, very heart, the very center of the curriculum. In education, the question is often more significant than the answer. Let me move to, from my conjecture on great books, to the related and virtually twin topic of the humanities. I find myself in the odd position of addressing the question, as was brought to your attention today, why are the humanities disappearing? In most instances, my interrogators assume I will say something about the desire for vocational education in an environment where jobs are scarce. Clearly, that's an answer, but a partial and unreflective response in my judgment. Based on my experience in the academy for over 35 years, I have noticed an evolutionary condition far more significant and far more malignant than the rise of vocational education. For most of my academic life, I resided in a place called Western civilization. My leaders in this congenial home were Aristotle and Plato and Dante and Shakespeare and Tolstoy and Machiavelli and Mozart and Rembrandt, to name a few. My life, my views were cultivated by these people and their work was imbibed as if mother's milk. 
They weren't always tranquil. In fact, on many occasions, they were disquieting. But they were my whole. They told me who I am, what I believe, and what questions about life I should ask. They were the guides in a complex and often dark world. What happened to my ideational home? It was cast down a slide into fragmentation and trivialization. There are scholars who will know about one or maybe two of these guides, but they no longer live in Western civilization. The common core is no longer common. The foundation of this home was a belief in the best that has been thought and written. Thank you, Matthew Arnold. Conditions that divide us, such as class, gender, and race, were subordinated to a common humanity, the glue that keeps the civilization intact. Now the civilization is split at the seams, disappearing before our eyes as a weight falling into the sea. There isn't a there there. It is a civilization suffering from homelessness, where remains of the humanities are fragments, puzzle parts that don't connect. How can a student possibly appreciate the civilization in which he resides when he sees only fragments, division, and needless specialization. At Bowdoin, where I gave a speech very recently, among other places, personal judgment is disabled, crippled by theoretical borrowing. Every professor has a theory, usually imposed on students. The independence of consciousness, not to be confused with Clement Greenberg's apt line, the herd of independent thinkers, <laughs> is immune to the noise of selective history and the distraction of scholarly fashion. It should be at the heart of the educational struggle. Each year that passes, newly minted PhDs enter the ranks of the professoriate with new arcane specialties. Did Hamlet suffer from an Oedipus comp complex? I actually heard professors talk about that. Was the, the know-nothing movement a uh, paranoia, as Mr. Hofstetter once argued? These questions in themselves are reasonable, but they overlook the sweep and the depth of human experience. Those who graduate into the academy arrive never having lived in Western civilization. Now, I should make a point, by the way. It's a point that was made by Saul Bellow, although never, no one ever understood the context when he said, did the Zulus ever create a Tolstoy? And it was an unfair comment, in way, but you had to understand the context for it. There are wonderful things to read outside of Western civilization. The Upanishads, the Analects, there are great works. But if you want to understand your life in this world, it is Western civilization that is your essence. Those who graduate into the academy very often arrive without living in this civilization. The air, the air they breathe is clear, but it doesn't have the dusty reminiscence of the past, with its glories and failures, its romances and betrayals, its majesty and its tyranny. They lack guides and perspective. Is it any wonder students do not see value in the humanities? Is it any wonder that the humanities is dying across the academic environment? They are aliens from their own traditions. Lying in wait is a time when business students will dominate the academy completely. The model will be bureaucracy. Rules will be legion, but enlightenment foreign. Inspiration will be a concept long forgotten, as will the humanities themselves. Although college students yearn for meaning, the drumbeat of fragmentation continues apace. Narrow and narrow are the assignment of readings. Much of what is assigned has been pre-digested. Read what Professor Jones or Professor Clark said about Plato. You don't have to read Plato. Hence, Plato doesn't have to be read. Here is yet another manifestation of fragmentation. The whole is there, just largely ignored. So when the question arises of why the humanities are disappearing from the curriculum, it should be noted that if we have lost a home in Western civilization, the humanities cannot be taught effectively or understood by students. The catalog that refers to the humanities is mechanistic. There is a belief these courses may be necessary, but few can describe why this is the case. The defense rests. Western civilization is in retreat, and the standards we once knew evaporate like soap bubbles. Fragmentation is all that is left, and frankly, that isn't much to build a university on. It's one of the reasons why I have so much confidence in what you were attempting to do at King's College. It's one of the reasons why I have had the great privilege 
of having an office here and spending some time with Professor Thornberry and the people that I've come to know at this extraordinary institution. So our task is clear. Save Western civilization. Save it from fragmentation. Save it from trivialization. Save it from current fashions. Save it from theoreticians, from scholars without civilizational roots. As a young man, I went to college, if you don't mind a personal statement. I went to college to play basketball. It was the hardwood in the gym that meant much to me. Till that day, that moment, I enrolled in a seminar with Jock Barzin and Lionel Trilling at Columbia. Like a Niagara, my mind was open in a world of ideas that was a literal fireworks. My loyalty was transferred from the gym to the hardwood on the library shelves. <laughs> Most significantly, I came to reside in Western thought. From my experience, I would contend that only a revitalization of the humanities as an end in itself can draw students into an active, passive conversation with the past that can restore the vision of what we have lost. What I want from literature from humanities is what Lionel Trilling christened the aesthetic effect of intellectual cogency. Passages whose combination of thought and language of form and content are so seamlessly integrated that the pleasure one derives from understanding the text is almost physiological in nature. The humanities have always been a conversation among writers, thinkers, students who borrow, build upon, and deviate from each other's words. Forgetting this, we forget that aesthetics is not a social invention, that democracy is not an aesthetic category, and that the dismantling of hierarchies is tantamount to an erasure of history. Great is great. It is not relative. One may be a fan of Agatha Christie. She is not Shakespeare. <laughs> We have an obligation to assert this hierarchical structure, to make judgments for our students and to help them appreciate what may be lost in the tangle of relativism. Hence my lamentation. Kafka may have noted, there is always hope, but not for us. <laughs> I disagree. I believe in redemption. I even believe higher, edu higher education can be saved from itself. And I like to believe it starts here. For those who are exceedingly pessimistic, I'd like to end on this story. It's a story, one of my favorite tales, tells about two individuals, one named Fast Eddie, who you've seen characterized in many films about the mafia in the 1920s. He was the legal associate of Al Capone. Fast Eddie would always find some technicality when a member of the Capone team was captured or facing indictment, and he would say, you can get them off if you understand these legal matters. He became one of the richest men in Chicago, as you might guess, since Capone paid him very handsomely. He was well known as a something dashing figure in this community, but he was thoroughly unethical. He had an enormous mansion right in the center of Chicago, and one day, as he was leaving his home, 15 bullets filled his body. The assailants were never found. And that was because Capone thought that he could not be trusted. That's Fast Eddie, a rather interesting figure in the history of Chicago. And now I turn to another figure whose name is Butch O'Hare. Butch O'Hare was a pilot in the Navy during World War II. He was on an aircraft carrier and had a mission and started off with a squadron of planes and he looked at his fuel uh, meter, and he found that he was running out of fuel. His he radioed to his captain, and the captain said, Butch, the wisest thing to do is get back to the aircraft carrier. So he starts to fly back to the aircraft carrier, and on the way he sees six Japanese zeros about to attack the carrier. And he flies into one, taking off its tail. He uses his machine gun, takes out another. Takes out a third. And he is hit as well. His plane is hit. He manages to limp back to the aircraft carrier. He continues to fight in World War II, and he is ultimately killed in the Marianas Islands. He is the most heavily decorated naval officer in American history, winning the Naval Cross and ultimately the Medal of Honor posthumously.
and life. And in fact, the largest airport in the United States is named after him, O'Hare Airport. If you go to Terminal 2 in, air, uh, in the airport, there is a giant sta statue of Butch O'Hare and tells the story of his exploits in World War II, which were quite astounding. Remarkable man, remarkable story. One of the great stories in American life. But there's one thing that is not mentioned in the statue. His father was Fast Eddie. Now, what is interesting about this story is that in American life, as one of my great mentors, Fat Swaller, once said, <laughs> One never knows, do one. <laughs> well, let me suggest to you that it's a great pleasure being with you, being associated with King's College. I also want to take this opportunity to give you a chance to talk to me. So if you have some questions, I've probably talked a little too long, but if you have questions, I want to entertain those questions now. And since the first question was asked by our distinguished president, let me attempt to address this issue of Netanyahu and the speech that was given yesterday to the Congress. In my judgment, it was a momentous and historic occasion, in large part because what is at stake here is the very future of Israel and a relationship with the United States. Iran has made it clear three weeks ago the supreme leader of Iran said, there is no cure, I'm quoting, there is no cure for Israel, there is only annihilation. If you're sitting in Netanyahu's chair, you have to take this matter seriously. And Iran, with the possession of nuclear weapons or even the Faisal material to build nuclear weapons, represents a distinct threat to the very existence of this state. It also represents a threat to the region. And if you consider the fact that chess was invented in Iran, they are very clever about their goals. They know exactly what they want to achieve. A nuclear weapon is not merely a military weapon, it's also a political weapon. In any escalation scenario, you reach a point where you say, we cannot continue because they do possess nuclear weapons. And so you look at what the empire has already been established. The empire suggests there are four capitals, as was pointed out by Netanyahu in yesterday's speech, one in Sana'a, one in Beirut, one in Lebanon, in Lebanon, of course, is Beirut, Damascus, and Baghdad. And so what is emerging here is a Shia crescent that could dominate the area. Several years ago, I met the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Iran, and I had the, uh, the bold, I made the bold comment, I assume, sir, that you are very much interested in creating the Shia Crescent in the Middle East. He looked at me, smiled, and he said, no, no, it's not the Crescent, it's the full moon. So it was very clear what the Iranians have in mind. And there is a strategy that is necessary to deal with this matter. I've written a good deal about it, others have as well. I think you have to create a NATO in the Middle East. I think Netanyahu understands that. He will be an unregistered member of that coalition, but I think the coalition is emerging. That includes, of course, Egypt and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Jordan and, and, uh, and Kuwait, what I call the Big Five. So I think that there are possibilities here, but unfortunately, I don't think that this administration sufficiently understands what's at stake, nor do I think they have an understanding of how to proceed. So I think that what Netanyahu has suggested is this is the catalyst. This is a speech that may change the character of foreign policy, at least I hope so. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, a very good question, but I'm happy to entertain other comments as well. Let's first of all thank Dr. Lund. Yes, sir. So, uh, you may have seen that a uh, pair. Thank you. Yeah, you may have seen that a pair of uh, liberal arts colleges recently closed: uh, Tennessee Temple and Sweetbriar. Tennessee Temple is a small Christian liberal arts college. Sweetbriar, a more rural uh, women's liberal arts college. So, in many ways, different uh, than our own experience here. But, do you have any uh, suggestions or diagnoses for how? Kings can avoid the same fate. Look, the, uh, the problems that one faces, the financial problems that one faces in higher education are formidable. And I certainly do not want to be in the shoes of your distinguished president. But at the same time, I think it's important to note that you have a mission. That mission is unique. The extent to which you can be an idiocratic institution representing principles that I think are essential for, the West, for Western civilization will put you in a very, very important spot. And I think that spot will be recognized. 
So I think that what is very necessary is for you to continue to articulate what separates King's College from others. Again, if you're marching with the herd of those in higher education, it's very hard to make any distinguishing characteristics. But I think that there is something about this experience that is very, very unique and that I think has to be emphasized. And in the, in the end, that will be the payoff. If universities all look alike and do the same sort of things and everyone is engaged in post-structuralism, which makes me sick, and we go through the same kind of experiences over and over, I can understand why many of these universities will fail. I also think that the MOOCs represent a threat. That is, the online opportunities represent the threat to many institutions. But when you consider what I think separates you, that is, a devotion to true Judeo-Christian principles, I think in the end that, that will be the issue that will make King's College the great institution that I'm absolutely confident it will continue to be. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Um, I was wondering because, you know, I agree with what you said, but in, in kind of an era of globalization that we have, where that presents certain problems or certain adjustments possibly, where our exposure to other ideas and great books from other places sort of make those a part of our Western experience. Do you think it is legitimate to you know, adjust, I hate to use that word, our canon to include those that actually do have made themselves a part of our Western civilization? Well, again, Western civilization is changing. There's no question it's dynamic. And I think that you have to be open to the possibility that there will be others. But I think that what you have to do first is to assert what you believe in. And that is the problem. The problem, as I see it, is that we're far too willing to accept a variety of different un, uh, un, understandings, if I can call it that, and at the same time, not willing to defend what is unique about Western civilization. Keep in mind that there was a great experiment that was created when the founding fathers of this nation built this nation. And there was a great experiment that occurred at the Magna Carta. Carta. And there was a great experiment that has occurred in Athens and in Rome and in Jerusalem. Those experiments are experiments that we should understand. They have created what we are as a people. They have made us very unique. The other day I was engaged in a conversation of precisely this variety at CPAC, and someone was saying to me, well, you know, you don't fully understand that there are many civilizations that have created extraordinary opportunities for people. And I say, well, name one that defends individual rights. Because I believe in individual rights. Well, name one. Tell me where there's a constitutional provision for protecting individual rights somewhere else in the world. Well, it doesn't exist. And why? Because what is unique about our traditions have led direct, directly to notions of the rule of law and to individual rights and to the free market that we enjoy as a people. So that, I think, is important. It's important for you to be in a position where you can defend those arguments. And that isn't to say you're not open to the dynamic character of Western civilization, but I think first should be the defense. Joe, always like to hear from Joe Lacanti. Herb, thank you for a very provocative talk and for that uh, extravagant praise. Whatever you're drinking, I want to get a glass of it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, some people have described the moment that we're in as a kind of a lack of civilizational confidence. And I'm wondering if you think that higher education uh, is it the most strategic institution that needs to be engaged in this, in recovering that civilizational comp? Well, are there other institutions you would put on the list? Do they need to work in tandem? Just some thoughts about that. Well, I mean, look, I think it's a great question. And part of the difficulty is that I have lost confidence in what is happening in many of the elite institutions in the United States. Part of the difficulty is they are no longer willing to defend their own civilization. In many instances, as I indicated before, you see three ideas at work. One is an ideological view that is a kind of hardcore anti-American attitude that has now become very prevalent in American institutions. The second is trivialization, which I got the silliness of so many of the courses that are offered. And the third is this increase in fragmentation or specialization, which I think also challenges the way in which we should conduct ourselves. There are overarching themes. I tried to identify them in some of them in my speech today. And when we talk about what an education should be, ultimately you're asking questions of who am I? Why do I leave my mark here? Recognizing the fact, as I indicated before, the derision of death we all face, what does it mean to be an American circa 2015? These are interesting questions and questions that are very, very rarely addressed in higher education. So I have lost a lot of confidence in the traditional universities. 
And my feeling is that the Lionel trilling and bars and experience that I had is very rarely duplicated today, even at Columbia, even at Columbia. So I, I think that there are other institutions that might play a role. There are think tanks that sometimes are more open than universities, which have a, a hardcore left-wing orthodoxy. And I think that if you are going to institutions of that kind, you can play a role. But I also think that places like King's College are important. I regard them as a beachhead. From the beachhead, you move further inland. And you think that this is a kind of incremental change that's occurring. But when you think around the role of King's College, for example, it strikes me that King's College becomes the beachhead, the oasis for the way in which we would like universities to conduct themselves, or at least raise the kinds of questions that others in the university system should consider. Dr. Lin yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you have the microphone. Please, go ahead. Okay, Dr. Lennon, um, what, what is your view of Common Core for public schools? Uh, I have a, a great belief in federalism. And what has happened with the Common Core is number one, the Common Core is very often a way to attract government money into the states. I think that that's a terrible mistake. I think we have a 10th Amendment which clearly suggests that the state should control education and the educational curriculum. Moreover, I've had this conversation with uh, Jeb Bush, who uh, I admire on many levels, so I'm not using this as a way of casting aspersions on him. But Jeb, Jeb said to me the other day, not, not so long ago, that one of the problems that he has, or that he has with my position, is that you do not understand we must move to world-class standards in order to promote an America that's competitive with other nations. And I, I looked at him, I scratched my head, and I said, but sir, the mathematics curriculum, to cite one example, the highest level of attainment is algebra, not geometry, not trigonometry, not calculus. So if you learn algebra, that's the highest level that's demanded of common core, how could you call that a world-class standard for me, it's a marginal standard. So that was just one illustration. So I think that one, I don't think the common core, I think to some degree has created an environment where we like to believe that marginal standards or lower standards are desirable. And the reason for that is that obviously there's a lot of back scratching in the creation of the common core. That is, if the standards are very high, a lot of people will fail. If a lot of people fail, there's a political outcome to that. Years ago, excuse me for this long-winded response, years ago the governor of Indiana, when I was spending a good deal of time in Indiana, asked me if I would design a test for third, fifth, and eighth graders in the school system. And I did. And I worked with my colleagues in putting this test together, and the remarkable thing about it is that the first time the tests were given, I think it was 31% 30 of the students passed these examinations. And the political outcry was remarkable. So the governor called me up and he said, well, wait a second, we, we've got to modify the test. <laughs> test is too hard. Now, Mary and Johnny are brilliant. You have to understand that, because if you're a parent, Mary and Johnny know everything. So how is it that Mary and Johnny are doing poorly on this test? It must be the test. So I modify the test. Modify the test, I try very hard to maintain some standards. Next time, I think it was 42% that passed. <laughs> Still a political outcry. And then finally, the governor, the governor said, forget it, we're not giving the test. Now, this is the problem that you have. You're dealing with the issue of politics, and you're dealing with the issue of standards. They're not compatible. They're not at all compatible. <laughs> and that's, that's a problem. It's a problem that Jeb Bush is gonna have to face during the course of this campaign season, and it's a problem associated with the Common Core. Another question. There's uh, someone who's holding the microphone. Yes, please, yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, uh, I uh, am familiar with the Columbia program, I've taught uh, literature, humanities, and Western civilization at Columbia. So I appreciate uh, also your uh, viewpoints and especially bringing out the uh, special qualities of the program here at King's. I just had a question in terms of uh, there's several still surviving, such surviving models that emphasize the classics and Western civilization, Columbia, and of course the Gallatin School and, and King's. And so what can be done in terms of maybe building more connections between them and propagating this model. So well, I, I, I think, you know, I, I talk about my Columbia experience and it was one of the reasons why I created the program at NYU in the first place. I was inspired by what happened to me at Columbia. You know, they have the CC hum continuum, that two year period where you studied civilizations, uh, uh, contemporary civilization, as well as the great books in the, uh, in, uh, in the humanities. 
And I found it to be a very inspiring experience. So I come to NYU and uh, I finally convinced the president of the university that we need a program of this kind because he would invariably stand up at graduation and say the students seated before you can solve the issues of war and peace, income disparity, um, urban woe. And of course these platitudes are kind of silly. You don't even know they read a good book. And I said that to the president. <laughs> So he looked at me and he said, well, why don't you create a program? And that's how it happened. I created a program organized around great books. But the story doesn't end there. And, and in fact, it has a, a kind of sad ending. Uh, I, I ran that program for 20 years. I tried to maintain standards appropriately. In fact, one of the things I did was I had students wear a cap and gown during their oral examination where they had to demonstrate that they were conversant with 87 great books. And so it was a very serious ceremony. I had faculty members from other parts of the university that would attend. We would have several people seated in the room. No one was gonna say on what's on page 52 of Dante's Inferno, but they would say, let's talk about Dante. And so the Divine Comedy obviously would be a subject. And you know, this, is, uh, this would go on, let's talk about Plato's Republic. They wouldn't say what's on page 67, but they would say, let's talk about Plato's Republic. So I, I think that it worked fairly well in my judgment. When I left, my successor was a person who saw the world very differently. She and I were interviewed by the New York Times, and someone at the time said to me, well, tell me what you think the core should be. And I said, well, look, it's fairly obvious. I think students should be reading Shakespeare, and I think they should read Plato, and I think they should read the Bible, and I think they should read uh, Aristotle. And you could probably guess the other comments that I made. He asked my counterpart, who is now the new dean of the school, what do you think it's important to students to read? And she looked at him and said the following, and I'm quoting, it's more important for students to read Toni Morrison than read Shakespeare. Now, I'm not opposed to Toni Morrison, don't misunderstand. I think it's fine for students to read Toni Morrison, but Toni Morrison rather than Shakespeare? That's what I said before, to dismantle the hierarchical structure in the humanities is a mistake. Agatha Christie is not Shakespeare. Toni Morrison is not Shakespeare. And I think it's important for students to understand that. And unfortunately, my successor did not. So what happened is, after a couple of years, where Dante was taken out of the great books list, by the way, replaced by Franz Fanon, and then Shulamith Firestone was put on the great books list. Well, I don't think of Shulamith Firestone belonging on the great books list. But she had, the dean had her own agenda. And these were called great books. And I, at that point, wrote a letter to the president of the university and said, my portrait hangs here a beautiful portrait, I might add, a lot more attractive than I am. A lot more attractive than I am, by far. And I said, I would like it removed. Please remove the portrait. And it was a sad moment for me, because I felt that I had to cut the umbilical cord, that the, the college I created no longer stood for the principles that I believe in. And so that was a very, very sad moment. But I look across the academic horizon, and I see conditions very much like this, almost everywhere. It's not only at the Gallatin School at NYU, it's true across the board, where in fact this orthodoxy that I made reference to before has now insinuated itself into every crevice of academic life. And so unless you adhere to a certain political position, it's very likely that you become an outlier. And some people are chastened by the experience. Some people comply. Uh, I was not one of those who could. Uh, I served in the university senate by dint of my decanal position and every vote in the Senate while I was there was 77 to 1. I always used to say to the president of the university, we must have a roll call vote. Because otherwise, it was just a voice vote, you'd never hear my discontent. So that, I think that you know, it's, uh, it's, it's important to understand that there are standards that I think should be maintained. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for students to understand what are the basic elements of our civilization? Why are we here? What makes us unique? What are the true idiosyncratic features of Western life that put us in the kind of position that we're in today? And again, some of that is being lost. And it's being lost for a variety of reasons, including political people who believe that we should start looking like a social democratic European state. I think it's a mistake. Those states are failing. So why do you want to adopt a failing system? And yet, there are many who believe that that should be the position. There are some who think that the United States can no longer play a significant role in international affairs. That's also a mistake. There's no such thing as a vacuum in nature. There's no such thing as a vacuum in international affairs. The question is, what kind of role should we play? I would be the first to say we can't be the policeman of the world, but let me also remind people that if you don't have a policeman in the world, it's a pretty dangerous place. So again, there are a lot of conditions that we have to take into consideration, some of it based on our traditions, our past, 
And I think it's important for people to understand that. And that's one of the reasons why you can play such a significant role here. Um, so you ended your talk by saying that the redemption of Western civilization starts here. And as a senior at King's, this is sort of what I've been hearing for the, the past four years, but I can't help but sometimes feel helpless. Uh, like, besides rereading The Republic, what, what can students actually do to, to turn back the tide? Well, first, I'm looking for interns. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> let me know if we have any volunteers in this room. <laughs> No, the, I think that it's a, it's a valid question. It's a very valid question. You, you stand as a journeyman, having read the Bible and having read Plato, you stand as a journeyman, and it's important for you in, or in whatever organization you are associated with to play the role of the person who stands up and say, this is the standard, this is why we are in Western civilization, this is what I believe in. Too often people become cowed by what I guess is the prevailing sentiments in an organization. And you have so many people who think they're independent-minded but aren't at all. You can be independent-minded because you have a traditional background that stands as part of your past, part of the experience that you engaged in here at King's. I don't know what organization you're gonna be associated with in the future. I don't know if you're a future business student or you're someone who's gonna play a role in politics or perhaps even in, involved in some sort of religious activity. But it strikes me that wherever you are, these traditions are important. I'm reminded of one interesting story about a preacher who is in a southern church, and he's talking about end of days. And with great fire and brimstone, he says, let me tell you, at the end of days, there will be crying, there will be wailing, and there will be the gnashing of teeth. to make sure that they heard this message, he says, let me tell you, there will be crying, there will be wailing, there will be the gnashing of teeth. Someone seated in the front of that church that day said to the preacher, preacher, I have a little problem, I don't have any teeth. <laughs> preacher thinks for a moment and he says, at the end of days, teeth will be provided. <laughs> now, you have the teeth, you've been given the teeth. You can take a big bite out of life because of it. And I think that that would be my message. There is no way of really providing a guide. There's no pathway. It's a question of maintaining the beliefs and the thinking that went into the experience that you had here. Let's thank Herb London once again. That was fantastic, right? Thank you. Herb London is not going to vanish. I know um, a number of you still had questions. He's going to be here, and he's here. That's the good news. He is on campus. He's available to you. Uh, get to know him. And I want to say one other thing that uh, Herb would never say about himself, but uh, once upon a time when the King's College was recasting its vision for what it should be, you might wonder where the PP and E idea came from. This is the guy. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, you can talk to Herb, and then uh, some of you will be having lunch afterwards. Thank you so much for your attendance today. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>